Hello and welcome to our Sunbelt podcast with Matt and Nate, Countdown to Pensacola. This is episode five and it is tournament week. The countdown is now at zero, Nate, and we begin tournament play on Tuesday. The countdown cannot be scrubbed like NASA. We're going to go on Tuesday. I got my quarter zip on. I'm ready to coach, even though I can't anymore. But um, it's going to be a great time. You wearing your sneakers too? So you're ready? Of to course. Go? Absolutely. All right. So uh, we got 14 teams showing up in Pensacola to try to win the conference championship and go to the NCAA tournament as the automatic qualifier out of the Sun Belt. I think we've got six teams in this tournament that got a legitimate chance to win this thing. I also feel we have two heavyweight contenders at the top. Will both of them get to the final? Will one of them get to the final? I think I think one of them at least gets to the final. And I wouldn't be surprised if we get to Monday next week and both these teams talking about App State and uh, James sure. Madison is the one and two seeds who have spectacular seasons. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if both of them end up in the final. But I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't either. Well, last year and the co- last couple of years, teams that sat out for the double bye, a couple of them got beat. So uh, you know the coaches – don't tell the players like that, but they think about it and they probably over prepare for it. But um, yeah, JMU and Appalachian are definitely the top of the heap. Doesn't mean they'll get to the finals though. We're going to find out. It's going to be a great tournament. Yeah. Last year, two of the top four seeds got beat after sitting out the double bye yeah. and playing in the quarterfinals. That was the number one seed, the regular season champions, Southern Miss, and also uh, Marshall, the number three seed got beat uh, in the uh, opening round as well. So we'll see if uh, all the top seeds can advance beyond the quarterfinals. Hasn't usually happened here in this tournament. Chalk usually doesn't play out all the way through. And so we'll see what happens. So in this episode here, we're going to break down the bracket, going to break down uh, each of the individual matchups as best we can because the matchups are really only set through the first couple of rounds. And then we'll just talk about the teams as well. Plus, we're going to name our all Sunbelt starting five. So it's not the all Sunbelt team. It's the all Sunbelt starting five. And we'll also give out our uh, player of the year, coach of the year, freshman of the year awards. So Nate, going to let you start with our all Sunbelt starting five. And this is for the entire season and not just this past week as we've been doing in each podcast. Correct. And I did this a little different. Like I said, I got my quarters up on. So I'm coaching here. I thought, if I was coaching, give me five guys that I could win with. So and I think I got five pretty good ones. Okay. So we're going to start out with Terrence Edwards Jr. from James Madison University. I just got to do his game last week, last regular season game, and they were at Coastal. And of course, I watched him a ton of times on tape. Very versatile scorer. Can shoot from the outside, obviously, and go inside. Good free throw shooter. Leader of the team. But the thing that impressed me most about him was he just finds a way to score. He was off balance. He gets bumped. And he's been doing it all season. They have more wins than anybody in the country. And uh, I just think he's my number one pick. And I, he's one of the five I definitely can win with. He is the best player on the team that has more wins than anybody else in the country. That's James Madison. They go into yep. the tournament with 28. It's a logical choice. And I agree with you. I have Terrence Edwards in my starting five as well. He can rebound, he can score, he can play make. Does it all. And he, can do, he does everything for him. So he's a, he's a you know, to me, an obvious choice for the uh, all Sun Belt starting five. Who's next? There were so many great guards in this league. I had trouble with picking them. But this young man doesn't have great 22-point-a-game numbers, but he's the winningest player ever at Appalachian State. They won the regular season. They beat James Madison twice in that regular season. Donovan Gregory is my second pick. He just does everything for this team. End of a shot clock, end of a half, end of the game. The ball's going to be in his hands. Not necessarily to shoot it, but to make the decision as to who's going to shoot it. Complete trust from Dustin Kearns in him. And if you're the winningest player ever at Appalachian State, that says something. He's been there, done that. I love Donovan Gregory. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. I don't have Donovan Gregory in my starting five. I think that's a solid decision because, like you said, you're put, you got your your quarter zip on and your sneakers. You're coaching. <laughs> so if I was actually, you know, if I'm thinking about this thing as a team that I want to put on the floor, I definitely yep. want Donovan Gregory out there, or certainly I want him in my rotation. 
because he's a guy that's a winner and knows how to win games at the end of the game. You can count on him. You can trust him. He's not going to make mistakes. That's a good choice, but I don't have him. I do have an App State player, and obviously that would be dumb not to have an App State player on your all-starting five <laughs> since they won the regular season championship, right? I got Trayvon Spillers. Trayvon Spillers averaged 13-plus points right at 14 points per game, 10 rebounds per game, averaged a double-double. These are his conference numbers. I, I look at the – these are the numbers that he put up in the sun. Sure. Not, not necessarily his overall numbers if someone's, like, fact-checking me right now and saying, well, those aren't his numbers. Those are his numbers in Sunbelt play. That's all it counts. Yeah, to me it is. I mean, to me because it's equal competition and p- teams don't play the same schedule. Some teams play harder schedules than others. Sure. And, you know, it's really not a fair comparison. The fair comparison is what they do in conference play. I got Trayvon Spillers on my all Sun Belt starting five. Okay, my third, you got to have a point guard. And this young man for Arkansas State, new system, new coach. But Caleb Fields leads the league in assists, leads the league in assist to turnover ratio. I think it's almost six assists a game in Sunbelt play. And he scores. Um, he's just a, he's a great point guard. He doesn't turn it over. He distributes the ball. If you worry about the other shooters, he'll blow right by you. Um, and you got to have a great point guard to be a great team. And I'm picking Caleb Fields as my point guard on this five. He's my point guard on my all Sun Belt starting five, too. Again, he's like like Terrence Edwards to me. He's a no brainer. He's averaging yep. 14 points per game in conference play, six and a half assists per game in conference play. So unto himself, he's accounting for nearly 30 of their points every game. I mean, you're talking about over a third of their points every game he accounts for, and he's a great playmaker, and I've got him on my all Sun Belt starting five as well. All right, that's my perimeter players and point guard. Now I'm going to go back inside, and I like Trayvon Spillers as well as my fourth player. First year on the team. Um, came into a team that had some established players, a lot of transfers coming in, but he just gives them the perfect match for Absom inside, who's a great shot blocker. Spillers is the, the, the athletic of the two bigs, can score inside, can rebound. He's a great rim runner, and Appalachian doesn't fly down the floor, but when they do, he's the guy at the other end laying it in. Very athletic, very long, and he's just the perfect piece to put in that puzzle for Appalachian State and uh, Dustin Kearns to make them a complete team, and he did it this year. So I'm picking Trayvon as well. All right, I'm going with Joe Charles from Louisiana. The Cajun Cajuns. We talked to Bob Marlin on our podcast last week, and you just really cannot uh, overestimate the value that Joe Charles has brought, brought to this team, especially with Jordan Brown leaving right before the season, going right. to the transfer portal, going to Memphis. He has really bailed them out this year. 12 points per game, 10-plus rebounds per game, really almost 11 rebounds per game, and two steals per game. He's a great defender, and he's just a great player. I think he's probably the most, uh, you know, undervalued player as far as publicity and recognition in the Sun Belt. We'll find out once they put out the teams here in the next 24 hours how that pans out, what, you know, what kind of honors does he get from the conference. But the one honor that he does get, he's on Matt's, all Sun Belt starting five. So what else do you want? Come on. That and five dollars will get you a coffee at Starbucks. But you know maybe six. Uh, but yeah, Joe Charles is on my all Sun Belt starting five. All right, my last guy, since I did all of their home games and I love watching him play, and he's improved so much over the year. Ginica, they call him Big John Ojiaco for Coastal Carolina. 17 double doubles on the season, and I think four or five of those games. He was one point or one rebound away from uh, having four or five more. The leader is a kid from Western Carolina who's a point guard who had 24 double-doubles on the season. But John Ojiaco has been doubled every time he touches it. He still is a walking double-double. Without him, I don't know if Coastal would be in any games, let alone win any games. And uh, he's improved so much over the year. He's a great kid. He's a great athlete. Talk about a rim runner. He can fly down the floor. He's 6'10", about 250 pounds. And I just love John Ojiaco as my postman on this five-man rotation. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how the all-Sun Belt uh, honors the coaches voting on these players, how that pans out and everything, because he certainly is a deserving candidate with the double-doubles and what he's done for that Coastal team this year. It's going to be fun to watch him in the tournament when they – 
play in that uh, first round matchup against yep. ULM. So we'll talk about more more about that in greater detail in just a few minutes. But uh, my fifth player on my all Sun Belt starting five is going to be Austin Crowley from Southern Miss. Uh, 17 points per game, close to five rebounds per game, uh, three assists per game. I just think he's a spectacular, talented player. And I think uh, the, the stats probably do not uh, totally tell the total picture of just how talented yep. he is. But I've got Austin Crowley on that uh, Southern Miss team on our all Sun Belt starting five. So that's our starting five. Let's hit the well, honors now. Let's start with your player of the year. One thing about Austin Crowley before we get to that, sure. preseason player of the year. So a lot of heat on him, a lot of target on his back, and he still performed exceptionally well. Yeah. yeah. Player, player of the year. Of the year? He, he, my player of the year, got to go with Terrence Edwards Jr. Yeah, don't He's a very good player in a team that won more games than anybody in the country, won more road games than anybody in the country, lost to Appalachian State twice, which they might have a chance to redeem themselves. But he just does everything. He's the glue guy on that team. He's the leader of that team. Um, I always think, what would happen if you take that player who you pick as your player of the year off that team? They'd still be good. But I don't know if they'd be as good as they are. He's just really, really good. And I, I, I just love him as a as player of the year in the league. We'll see what happens. So let's take that argument that you just made and apply it to my player of the year. And I agree with you. I don't disagree with you on Terrence Edwards. To me, he's a 1A. And my guy might be the 1B. And I think Terrence Edwards, once they finish voting in, amongst the coaches, that he'll be the guy that wins it. But I, I'd like to make an argument for my guy, and that's Caleb Fields. Of, of Arkansas sure. State for all the things I already said about him when we uh, put him on our all Sun Belt starting five, take him away. Where is Arkansas sure. State with that offense that they run without a guy to play make and get the ball to the right spots yep. and make that offense run? Uh, he would be my choice for Player of the Year. In the yeah, it's a point oh, guard centric offense, and you got to have somebody run the show, and he runs it so except exceptionally well for Coach Hodgson. No doubt. How about your Coach of the Year? Well, that was a tough one. Uh, I had it down to three. I went to the committee, which is my, my uh, left ear and my right ear. And uh, only because they beat the team that has more wins in the country twice in the season, I went with Dustin Kearns at App State. That's a legitimate uh, argument. Season. Mark Byington had a great season. But um, they beat Mark Byington twice. And this is, as you just said before, this is about the regular season, not the tournament. Right. So, uh, along with Bobby Kremens in the Mount Rushmore of uh, Appalachian State as coach of the years, I'll give it to uh, Dustin Kearns this year. Yeah, that's a legitimate argument that you make there. I mean, James Madison, 28-3, and three, as you and I are talking right now, and two yep. of those three losses came from Dustin Kearns' team. True. So, I don't disagree with that. Uh, it, it's hard to go against either one of those guys, given the incredible record that they have put together. But I like to, when I vote for coach of the year, I like to base mine based on what was the expectation of the team that year and what did they do relative to that expectation. And most everybody thought that App and, and James Madison were going to have good. Sure. I don't know that anybody thought they were going to have the years they're having, you know, with over, you know, 50, you know, 55 plus wins between the two of them or close to 55 plus yep. wins between the two of them. Don't know anybody thought it was going to be that good. So you can make that argument. I don't disagree with Kearns or even Byington as your coach of the year. But I'm going to go with Brian Hodgson of Arkansas good choice. State. Nobody thought anything true. Uh, about what they might be able to do this year. I, you know, I, did, I I'm, True confession, I didn't give them a second thought when the season started. New coach. I mean, what's the chance that the new coach is going to come in there and make a dramatic impact? Yep. Certainly an impact where they are, you know, a top four seed in the Sun Belt. Been a long time, been a long time since Arkansas State has been as good as they are this year. And Coach Hodgson is the reason why, and he's my coach of the year. He, Definitely changed the way they do things down there, and they're doing it really well. No doubt. No doubt. All right, freshman of the year. Okay, I had it down to three once again. But uh, this young man... I think he's seventh in the league in scoring. He leads his team in minutes. He leads his team in scoring. And he leads his team in heart. This kid plays so hard. 
Jacob Meyer for Deshaun Clears of Coastal Carolina. Uh, scored over 3,200 points in high school. Okay, a lot of guys score points in high school, but that's a ton. Second, Mr. Basketball in the state of Kentucky. Comes into Coastal Carolina, into college, obviously. And uh, he's not going to score 3,200 points, but he's never hit the freshman wall. I said he plays more minutes than anybody. And he just plays as hard or harder than anybody that he's played against. And he was a scorer in high school. And halfway through the season, Coach Benny Moss says he uh, turned him into a point guard. And he's got to run the show as well and deal with the pressure as well. And he's still done an exceptional job. And I pick him as my freshman year, Jacob Meyer for Coastal. Yeah, I think there's a great argument to be made for Jacob Meyer. And I don't disagree with you on this choice at all. Uh, talking to Benny Moss, the young man's developed his game. Uh, yep. You know, he's come in and he's gotten better because of the things that you talked about right there. They turned him into a point guard and he had to learn how to be a different kind of player. Uh, sure. Early on in the season, he'd get the ball. And he'd just go right at the rim. He's getting his shots blocked because, hey, look, those are the things he did in high school and it worked. Well, he found out, he learned yep. quickly. You, get, you don't do that here. The guys here at this level are just as athletic or maybe even more athletic than you. So he learned how to be a playmaker, a facilitator, as well as being a scorer, and he became a better defender as well. Uh, if I had a vote, I would, I honestly, I would go Jacob Meyer. But since this is... <laughs> the Sunbelt Hoop Matt and Nate podcast, not podcast, and we have to choose a different player. We can't just uh, glom on to each other here. Uh, I'm going to go with Miles Rigsby of Troy. Good call. Uh, who, who had a really good season, uh, had some 20 point, point games. He's been, he's really kind of been uh, some some really good offense for Troy this year. So I like what he's been able to do: 13 and a half points per game in conference play, five rebounds per game, and close to two steals per game. So uh, if I had to choose somebody other than Jacob Meyer, let's put it that way, I'd go with Miles Rigsby as my freshman of the year from the Troy Trojans. So that gets us through our teams, Nate. It's time to look at the bracket. So we're not gonna we're not gonna pick we're not gonna make choices we're not gonna make predictions here. And you can't don't, don't go to your local bookie because of us. Yeah no yeah we we you know we don't want to compromise our uh, you know, our subjectivity and our sure. impartiality as we call these tournament games. Not that it would be even if we did. But we don't even want to uh, create the appearance of anything like that. So we're gonna go through the bracket and just talk about the matchups and the teams and uh, hope you. Hopefully, uh, it'll give you some insight into what you should expect to see uh, if you're not there in Pensacola or if you're watching the games here on uh, or on ESPN Plus, as we will be calling the first 12 games of the tournament leading up to the finals. So, tournament starts on Tuesday. Uh, first round action. These are the bottom four teams in the standings. And the first game of the day is the 12 seed ULM taking on the 13 seed Coastal Carolina. What do you think about this matchup? Well, and speaking of Coach Richard and Coach uh, Benny Moss today, um, Coach Richard talked about they've had issues offensively in lulls and, and games and stretches of games. But if they can get things going and they, they want to push the pace a little bit, um, he feels good about what they can do when they get there. Um, on the other side, Coastal Carolina, they had JMU on the ropes the last game of the season. They played really well. I think it was a two-point game with two or three minutes to go, and yeah. uh, I, I think it was I, I think it was down to like a two-point game with less than two minutes. Yeah, uh, three. And, uh, three. Uh, Raekwon hit a big three for JMU from the top of the circle that bumped it up, and then it turned into a ten-point game because of fouls and all that stuff. But uh, Meyer played well. Ojiako played very well. Uh, I think ULM is going to have to deal with Ojiako inside or make a decision on how they're going to deal with Ojiako inside. And then uh, Coastal Carolina's big um, issue has been turning the ball over. And when they turn it over and it's live ball turnovers, that kills them. Dead ball turnovers is not the end of the world. So I think it's going to come down to the efficiency of ULM offensively. And Coastal Carolina can be efficient offensively, but still if they turn it over, it, it diminishes all the fact that you work so hard in the offensive end. So the turnovers of Coastal against the offensive efficiency of um, – of ULM, I think it's going to come down to those two factors. Yeah, I, you know, look from a fan standpoint, you're looking at these two teams' records, and you're like, "Wow, that, wow, what a game!" But I look at this game, and you and I look at this game after we talked to Coach Richard and we talked to Coach Benny Moss. 
And I'm excited about the matchup. I think we've yep. got a fun game here. I really do. I, I think ULM is challenged once they get past Nika Meshvarishvili and Tyreek Lokur for an offensive standpoint. And, and he's Tyreek guy. playing, you know, Tyreek playing the point guard position, maybe playing a little bit out of position. He's probably better two guard than he is a point guard. But they gotta have him play the point guard position because you gotta have a point guard, and he's the best point guard on the team as well. So I think there's some challenges for ULM in that regard. Jacob Meyer, I think, uh, uh, you know, all these things about him that we've talked about already, and Ojiako and Kylan Blackman, I think, brings offense to the table. I think this is a game, I I think it's a toss-up game. I would call it a toss-up game for sure. But I think ULM uh, has played well in spurts down the stretch in the month of February, and Coastal's played well in spurts. But overall, look, you know, they haven't had great seasons. But I think it's a fun matchup, and I'm actually excited about the 12-13 and matchup. Second game of the day, we got 11 seed Texas State taking on 14 seed Old Dominion. Of course, Old Dominion, Jeff Jones retired uh, at the start of last week. And before the week was over, they've named his replacement Mike Jones, a former Old Dominion uh, player who most recently had been an assistant coach at Maryland, Virginia Tech. Before that, he coached at DeMatha Catholic, was highly successful there. So the succession plan is already in place. Uh, now, obviously, he's not coaching right. in the tournament. Not Kieran like football. Donahue, no, Kieran Donahue, Donahue who has been uh, the interim since Jeff Jones stepped aside with his heart issues and prostate cancer treatment, uh, he will be coaching this team. Really enjoyed our conversation with him. Yep. I mean, he's full of energy, and he's really fired up. He says he expects his team to go down there and play really hard. They did not play Texas State during the regular season. Last time these two teams played, was in this tournament in the second round last year when Texas State embarrassed ODU by 29 points. Well, and speaking, go back to Mike Jones for a second. When he was at the math, I was reading up about him. I didn't realize this. The great Morgan Wooten was there forever. Yeah. Mike Jones was the coach. They named the court after Mike Jones. That's how successful wow. he was. Morgan Wooten's probably got the gym named after him, but Mike Jones, they named the court after him. So uh, obviously he knows the area, the Maryland, Virginia area, former player at ODU. And uh, we'll see what he does coming in. But, uh, yeah, they, they didn't waste any time. Um, in looking at this one, I think it's going to come down to Chauncey Jenkins and company on offense against Texas State's in-your-face, guard your yard, don't get beat off the dribble defense. That's how they play well. They play hard. They're not big. They go crazy to the offensive glass if you miss. And if, uh, if they can take the un- – if they can make – Old Dominion uncomfortable offensively because of the way they play defense. They might have something going. If um, Chauncey Jenkins gets going, if you haven't seen Chauncey Jenkins, just Google a picture of John Morant. He's his twin. Looks just like him. Doesn't play as good as him, but plays pretty well. But if they can keep their composure against a tough man-to-man defense of Texas State, they can be in this thing. Um, You know, you and I have talked before we did this. One hot guard can run you through this tournament in a good way. Chauncey Jenkins could be that guard. He has the capability, certainly an all Sun Belt caliber team player, no doubt about that. Texas State playing well though. Uh, Texas State seven and three in their last yep. two games. They started one and eight in the Sun Belt, and then they went six and three in the Sun Belt in the last nine conference games, and included in their seven and three final ten games in the conference, they beat App State. And they beat Troy. So this is a team that is, are they set up to make another Cinderella run? They were the 11 seed last year and got to the semifinals. Can they yeah. do that again this year? I don't know, but I wouldn't put it past them. That's for sure. I agree. So that leads us to our second round, and that'll be on Thursday. There'll be a day off Wednesday. The men won't play. The women will be playing. And so on Thursday, we got four games, and it starts with the eight seed South Alabama and the nine seed Georgia Southern. Well, Richie Riley plays a di- speaking of South Alabama, plays a different kind of offense than almost anybody else in the league. It's almost an NBA-ish kind of offense, not because they run a lot, but because they take advantage of matchups and attack those matchups that they think they have an advantage in. Um, against Georgia Southern, who probably will mix up a little bit of a defense, Georgia Southern also has a disciple of Alabama, and they love the three ball, and they love layups. Yeah, but um, Richie Riley, South Alabama team, a little more athletic, 
a little bigger. Georgia Southern, a little more proficient from behind the three-point line. So we'll see which style prevails in that game. Once again, the middle-of-the-pack teams are there for a reason because they've, they're have they middle-of-the-pack, so anybody could beat anybody in these games. I really believe that. Yeah, South Alabama, you know, typical of South Alabama. Seems like they kind of do this every year. They start playing well, putting it together in the month of February. Yep. They did that last year. Last year they were the number eight seed, just as they are this year. Last year they got to the finals as the number eight seed yep. and lost by only six points to – uh, champion Louisiana. So I wouldn't put it past uh, South Alabama to be able to do another run like that again. Is it probable? Likely not. Is it, it you know, could it happen? Yes. Sure. Uh, they, they certainly have the talent uh, to do that with, with Gaither and Tyrell Turbo Jones and Smurf Millinder and, and all those guys. So I wouldn't put it past Richie Riley's team. And certainly uh, Georgia Southern, after they went winless in non, I've never seen anything like what they've been able to do this year. I've never seen a team go winless in non-conference and then put together a decent conference schedule. They went eight and ten after going winless. It's, it's usually isn't supposed to work that way, but that's exactly what they were able to do. So congratulations to them. That'll be our first matchup in the second round. Uh, then we've got number five Louisiana playing the winner of the ULM and Coastal Carolina game in the second game on Thursday. And Louisiana, we talked to Bob Marlin last week. Uh, they came out right after we talked to him, and they lost again. So <laughs> they lost to Troy. But they did close the season with a victory over Southern Miss to claim the five seed. Yeah, Coach Marlin has a, obviously a lot of talent on that team when you look on the roster. They'll get a chance to sit and watch that first game, and then they're going to play the winner that we just talked about. But it'd be interesting if, uh, if Coastal wins that game only because – Hosanna Gatinge, the new center transferred in for Louisiana, started his career at Coastal Carolina. Didn't play against Ojiaco, of course, because Ojiaco is only there this year. But Gatinge started at, at uh, Coastal. And if you've never watched Hosanna Gatinge play from London, England, he smiles the entire time he's on the floor. I love watching him play. He's 6'7", maybe 260, 270. Very mobile inside, great feet, big, strong body, wide shoulders. And uh, he's a matchup, tough matchup for anybody inside. And they got some serious talent on the perimeter as well. Louisiana could be one of those teams we talked about earlier that is not in the top four that could run all the way to the finals. Yeah, they got to put it back together, though. They have not played well here in the last two and a half, three weeks. They've lost four out of five. They lost four in a row until closing with the victory over Southern Miss. You know, Kobe Julian's a guy that if we'd talked to, if we'd made put together our team three weeks ago, he would have been on that team. Yeah. But he. Oh. You know, uh, but he's not. And, uh, you know, he I'm not saying he didn't play well. I mean, I, maybe it's the teams buckled down on him a little bit more, but he didn't score as much, did not was not as big an offensive threat down the stretch as he had been prior. At one point, I think they were they were right there at the top. They had won nine out of ten and then they kind of hit the spell. So uh, my big question with Louisiana is what team shows up in Pensacola? Have, have sure. they put it back together? Have they gotten back to where they were? when they were playing as one of the top teams in the league. Certainly capable. We'll find out when they play on Thursday. The next game, the third game on Thursday, will be number six, Southern Miss, kind of another enigma team for me, and they'll be playing the winner of the Texas State and Old Dominion game. Well, Juan Cordona has taken over as the assistant coach, and uh, that man That's is enthusiasm. Right. He's taken over um, as enthusiasm on steroids, if you watch him. He's an enthusiastic. If he could play defense, nobody would ever score against Southern Miss. But unfortunately, he can't. He's on the sidelines. But they got, they got a wild card. Young man Corbello was injured um, with concussion-like sy uh, symptoms. And then the first game back from concussion, he had 24. The next game, he had to take himself out of the game because he was dizzy. Had a couple more symptoms. Played, but didn't score well. The next game, he's okay, and he scores 24 again after missing a bunch of games. So if he can get it rolling, um, he can give them the juice that they need to get something going. You don't know. I hope he's healthy. I hope he's ready to roll. But Corbello was a great player before he transferred in there. He's a very, very talented guard. Yeah, he was the uh, all-freshman Big Ten at Illinois. He was the sixth man of the year as a freshman at Illinois. 
two seasons there. His second season, he was he was injured, transferred back home to New York, played at St. John's, and now yep. at wow. Southern Miss. But this is a team. I mean, they. I mean, if you take the players, if you can get them all on the same page, you're talking about Curbelo and Victor Hard and Austin Crowley and Victor Awuakor. These are all guys that are very talented. So yep. you cannot sleep on Southern Miss whatsoever. Again, but a team who shows up in Pensacola. Can they put it all together? If they do, they're a team that could make it to the final and, and win the thing. So, but, but kind of like Louisiana in that five spot, they're the sixth spot. You know, who's showing up for Pensacola? What team are we going to see? That's the question. And then in the last game of the day in the second round, we got seven seed Georgia State uh, moving back up the ladder. Remember last year, Jonas Hayes, his first year, disastrous season. Yep. Uh, Georgia State's kind of, you know, been been one of the top teams in this conference for the last decade. Uh, but then Rob Lanier took the SMU job, and they bring in Jonas Hayes, and they fall off into the bottom four last year, and they were quick out. But this year they're moving back up the ladder. The seven seed, they're playing Marshall, the 10 seed, who's going in the wrong direction. I think they've lost five or six in a row. And one of those was Georgia State, who just beat them in the regular season finale on Saturday, on Friday. Well, Georgia State... Um, has, has much improved from last year. Different players. They got one guy named Tanari Lane who leads the league, I believe, in three-point percentage. Um, he hit one at the buzzer or one second ago to beat Coastal Carolina. He's been making them all year. He's a lefty, which I love. Um, and they got some decent post players as well. They want to play with a little bit of pace, not as much as when Rob Lanier was there. And then on the other side, Coach D'Antoni, he makes it sound simple. It isn't. He always says it's just about making shots. Basketball is about making shots. There's a lot more to it than that. But they've not been making shots. I looked at their numbers this morning, and every percentage of almost every player has dropped in the last week to 10 days. So they're not making shots. And it's not that they're taking bad shots, just not making them. They get a couple days off, obviously, before they go down to Pensacola, and they'll see if they can turn it around. They don't have Tavion Kinsey anymore. He graduated. That's an excellent point, sir. Player of the year from a year ago, who was clear cut, clear cut player of the year a year ago, uh, and they lost some other pieces. Hand logged in their big seven foot, who was a freshman last year. He's now playing for the Florida Gators, and their guard who uh, went to where did he go? So he went to some place in the SEC. Uh, I caught myself caught myself making a point off the top of my head, and I can't remember the point I wanted to make. But they lost a lot of guys from last year, yep. so they never really have recovered. And this year, they they're closing out the season on a on a on a poor note. So we'll see if they can regroup and be ready to play on Thursday. So I'll tell you, it's been really good for them. Nate Martin transferred in from Texas State. We just talked about. He's been he's been special in the middle. If you play a zone against Marshall, he will stand on that foul line and pick you apart with assists. So when they have the shooters like Kerfman well, on the outside, you know, Nate Martin can find the open shooters. In that regard, it's kind of an NBA style offense, playing for the three. And in you know, yep. if you watch NBA games, your big men uh, typically going to average about three or four assists per game. Unlike college right. basketball, because the ball is going inside, and their job is to kick it out, kick to the corner three, kick to the wing three, uh, and he's good at doing that. And Brandon Kerfman's a guy; you know, he can hit threes with the best of them. So if he's hitting shots, they got a shot, and we'll see what happens. So let's move to the uh, the quarterfinal round. Now the double by teams enter into the tournament. This is on Saturday, and we don't really know what the matchups will be. Uh, we do know what they're bracketed against. Let's start with number one, App State, regular season champions, regular season champions for the first time or best record ever, first time since when you were coaching there with Bobby Crimmins. Uh, and they'd be matched up against the South Alabama and Georgia Southern winner. Yeah, we, we were 23-5 and five going to the NCAAs. We thought we were really good. They were better. Um, but they have a great – I told Dustin this early in the season when I talked to him. I think that those kids on that team, and that's a tribute to the kids and the coaches, understand their roles better than any other team in the league. Um, they know what to do, and they know how to do it exceptionally well. He's a big believer in that pack line defense where if you go past one guy, there's four guys waiting for you. And, and this year, they've improved it with quickness, and they're really quick in the backcourt, where they can get out the three-point shooters as well. So if you can stop the inside game and collapse and get the three-point shooters, 
That's how you win the regular season in the Sun Belt Conference. So Appalachian State's a special team. They're really good. I think JMU wants a piece of them if they can get back at it. But as good as they are as the number one seed, he knows the target's on his back. And uh, it's not going to be an easy run. But uh, I'd rather do it if I was him from on top than any other place. No doubt about it. Uh, it would be, you know, and, and if they don't win, if they don't, if they don't win, they're not going to the NCAA tournament. True. And you know, probably the same thing applies to James Madison. As great as their season has been, they go in as the two seed, and they're twenty eight and three right now as we speak. You know, two more wins, the quarters and the semis. They get to the finals. They're thirty and three. If they don't win that, you know, they they got to get to the final. If they don't get to the finals, we're not. This, this conversation is uh, null and void anyway. Exactly. Uh, talking about, and I think you know we've spent a lot of time talking about uh, you know what happens. Can they be an at large? Uh, I think they're focused on, and rightfully so, winning the conference championship because that's the only, that's the only guarantee you have, even as great as their season has been. And they'd be paired up against the uh, the Georgia State Marshall winner in the quarterfinals. Well, they got great talent. Obviously, they've won a ton of games. They have great confidence as well. But it was interesting. I did the last regular season game and speaking to Mark Byington at practice before that game. Uh, and he said this before. He said, you know, they won like 12 or 13 in a row to start, beat Michigan State to start the season. Then they lost a couple, tw- twice to Appalachian and other games too. Um, and he said, you know, people said, well, what happened? He said, you need to think about this. Those other teams are pretty good. They're yeah. all on scholarship." So it's not that we play bad. They just play better than us that day. And you got to give credit to the other teams. Um, but I think his kids believe they want another shot at the Mountaineers. Um, but Mark doesn't talk about the at-large stuff. He doesn't talk about it with his team. Because like Point. you said, they can control what they can control. Just win the games and make the NCAA make them put them in the tournament rather than hope you get in the tournament if you don't win it. Very talented team. They take you out of what you want to do defensively. That's why they have so many steals and so many fast break points. Um, because and the other thing that does is it takes the heat off your offense. If you can take away the ball when the other team's trying to do things and get easy run out opportunities, it takes the heat off you trying to score in the half court, and they're really good at both of those. And don't be surprised if either one of these teams, App State, James Madison wins the conference tournament, goes to the NCAA tournament, Kearns and or Byington, or maybe even both. Don't be surprised if they're on speed dial with, with, you know, uh, power conference programs looking Absolutely. to place the coach. So uh, they're, 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 those candidates, they are that good. Uh, they, and they have put together and what they've done with their programs is that good that they're going to get looks and good for them. I'm not saying that it's yep. going to happen. I'm not going to say that. I'm not saying they're leaving. I'm saying they're going to, there's going to be opportunities for them. Uh, no breaking news. No. Uh, three seed is Troy. Uh, they're going to be matched up against uh, the winner of the uh, Southern Miss Texas State Old Dominion side of the bracket. Scott Cross is all about defense. Scott Cross is all about execution. They lost the last game to Texas State, and his quote was, we just weren't tough enough. Well, I would not want to be in the practice getting ready for the tournament because he's all about take the stairs, make it tough, and uh, they will grind. If it's a close, grinded-out game, Troy's going to be right in the game at the end. Obviously, they have talent. They wouldn't be where they are. But they, uh, they try to knock you out of the box by playing defense, and uh, they're going to be a tough out when they get down to Pensacola, in my opinion. I, I, do, I agree with you. I mean, uh, a lot of attention is focused on, and we have focused a lot of attention on App and James Madison, but uh, don't be napping on Troy. There are teams certainly capable of going in there. Troy uh, beat App this, uh, in, the one, in their one matchup yep. they had this year, uh, one of the two conference losses for App. Uh, Troy was one, and Texas State was the other. So uh, Troy, two really good, yeah, good defensive teams. Would not be uh, ignoring in this bracket. So they're matched up. You know, if they can win that, if they can win that quarter, that means they're playing James Madison in all likelihood in the semifinals. And then uh, the number four seed is Arkansas State. 
And what a great surprise they have been this year. And that's why I had Brian Hodgson as my coach of the year. And they would be matched up with the uh, five seed Louisiana, ULM, and Coastal Carolina bracket winners. Uh, Louisiana beat them during the regular season. Uh, but that was early on before, before Arkansas State had really put it together. It'll be interesting. They'll be a fun team to watch here in the tournament. Well, I watched a bunch of their games um, during the season simply because uh, Coach Hodgson, as you said, nothing was expected, and they had a heck of a year. They love the three. He's a former Alabama assistant. Um, in fact, when they practice, he told me this, and they make it a competitive scrimmage. If you take a mid-range jumper, it only counts as one point. <laughs> so they don't like mid-range jumpers. They like threes. They like layups and dunks. Um, we talked about Caleb Fields. They have some really good three-point shooters as well who get open because Caleb Fields blows by people. Um, you got Terrence Hyde, you got Freddie Hicks. Game. You got Terrence Hyde, you got Freddie Hicks. You got uh, Avery Feltz, who's a three-point specialist. You got Isaiah Nelson getting rebounds and rim protecting. They got a yep. talented team. And Freddie Hicks will take you in. Freddie Hicks is about 6'4", 220, with shoulders as big as you and me put together. He will beat you up if he takes you inside and he goes hard to the rim. So they have a nice mix of talent. Coach Hutchins put it together well. They, like I said, they make 10 threes a game. They take a whole lot more than that. And many games I watched, they were down 15, 18. And it seems like in two minutes, it's a tie game because they just never stop shooting the three. And they want to shoot it. He wants them to shoot it. And they believe they're going to make them. So they're never out of a basketball game. Yes, yeah, the value of the three is an NBA-style offense. Yep. It comes, it's what Nate Oates has been doing. It's what Henry's doing at, at Georgia Southern. It's what Hodgson's doing yep. at Arkansas State. And I see this type of offense, not not to the extreme because I uh, that I do when I'm calling NBA G League games, which is that's right. all it is, and it's fast-paced, and there's no walking the ball up the floor. There's no trotting <laughs> the ball up the floor. Uh, but this is the kind of it's, it's similar to that. And so it'll be a lot of fun to call, be a lot of fun to watch, and they'll be the four seed. Of course, they'd be matched up if they're able to win. They'd be facing um, App in all likelihood in the semifinals, and App just beat them pretty good in Boone this past uh, Friday. So that is a look at the bracket, Nate. We've been through the bracket. We've been through our all starting five. All, all, now all we got to do is uh, show up and call the games, which we certainly look forward to doing. <laughs> Uh, we invite you, uh, if you if you got some spare change, head on down to Pensacola and make it a little vacation and watch your team play. Tickets are available through Ticketmaster and your individual institutions. And, Nate, if they can't get to Pensacola, they can always watch us on ESPN+. Plus. We will have the first 12 games of the tournament with game number 13, the championship game being on ESPN. I meant to say this last time, and I forgot. If you were at Pensacola... Take Uncle Nate's advice. Walk out of the arena to that street. I don't know the name of it. Make a left and go about Black three Black. blocks. Well, it's the only street right in front of the arena. Okay. Go about three blocks okay, down, sure. and there's a candy store on your left. Bubba Watson, the PGA golfer, owns it. Candies, um, ice cream. It's a really cool store to go into. There's bunches of bars and restaurants. But find the candy store there. Trust me, you will enjoy yourself in there. It's a neat place. Great advice from Uncle Nate. And with that, Nate, we'll say goodbye and end podcast number five and hope everybody has a fun time in Pensacola and hope your team wins, whoever that may be. Yep. 